Are you always wondering about the things around you? Do you always have the need to find out? Then, this is the show for you. Learn what makes things tick. Or how they simply came to be. Satisfy your curiosity. Welcome to another episode of Curious. Hashtag, you might have noticed how people nowadays tag all their photos and posts with a symbol that you vaguely remember as the number sign. What it is basically is a tagging and classifying symbol in today's internet-driven world. So for today, we will be taking a look at the hashtag. But first, let's take a quick look at its origins. The hash symbol is known by many names, like the number sign or the pound sign. Aside from social media's use of it, the symbol is also commonly used to denote numbers. The symbol traces its origins from the Roman term libra pondo or pound of weight, denoted by cursive strokes L and B. But to avoid confusion, the symbol eventually changed into two sets of parallel intersecting lines. In 1917, the symbol was adopted to denote numbers. Now, fast forward a bit to the late 1900s at the dawn of computers. The hash symbol became one of the characters used as part of many programming languages. During the 1970s, it was used to denote immediate address mode, and in 1978 became associated to denote special keywords in C programming language. During the rise of the first IRC chat rooms and networks in the 1990s, the hash symbol was used to denote and label topics of discussion. This use of the hash symbol is what inspired developer Chris Messina to propose the hashtag system to easily enable anybody to add classification tags to any topic in the microblogging site Twitter. By doing so, users can easily tag and search relevant posts to any type of topic. In August 23 of 2007, Messina posted the first hashtag on Twitter using his at Factory Joe username. How do you feel about using the pound symbol for groups, as in hashtag Barcamp? Initially, the hashtag wasn't well received, but it took off when Twitter became an avenue for users to report on the San Diego forest fire of 2007. And the use became international during the 2009-2010 Iranian elections. 2009 also saw Twitter incorporating hyperlinks with hashtags, which meant that other users can simply click on hashtags and search topics containing the same term. And the rest was history. Users began to use hashtags to group similar topics on posts. Soon, other social media sites such as Facebook and Instagram have followed suit. Today, the hashtag is so common that you can probably see it being used everywhere on advertisements, challenges, election campaigns, advocacies, and even just for plain old fun. It was even considered as the 2014 word of the year by the Oxford English Dictionary. The hashtag has even made its way to the current lingo and vernacular, making its way to everyday conversations and sentences such as hashtag wow and hashtag really? Making a hashtag is so easy. Just type the hash symbol next to a word and you're done. So tag away. Lotion. You know them as the liquid you use to rub your skin for moisturizing and for specific skin enhancing and protective features. Today, let's talk about the lotion. What is a lotion? A lotion is a slightly viscous liquid preparation that is applied on unbroken skin. The usual application methods include using brushes, cloth, but of course the most common is by rubbing with hands. Being a topical solution, lotions can be used as a medicine delivery system, especially for skin ailments. You can readily see these types of lotions at drugstores. 
The most common are antibiotics, antiseptics, antifungals, anti-acne, and anti-itch lotion. But it's also not uncommon to see lotions that are used simply to soothe and moisturize the skin. Some lotions are used as enhancers or protection. A good example is the sunblock lotion, a lotion that contains a suspension of small sunblocking particles that help prevent sunburn and skin damage caused by prolonged exposure to the sun. There's also sun tan lotion, a lotion that accelerates the tanning process by promoting the production of melanin, a naturally occurring pigment found in dark skin color. Most lotions get their viscosity from a combination of oil and water emulsion. These are then combined with other components such as fragrances, proteins, dyes, and other chemicals. Here's how lotion is typically made. First comes the oil phase, where flaky and powdered ingredients are mixed with oil. This is then followed by the addition of active ingredients, if the specific lotion calls for it. Some lotions may contain some of the following active ingredients like glycerin, which provides hydration and creates a barrier on the skin's surface, which allows the lotion to glide smoothly. Hyaluronic acid, a molecule that holds 1,000 times its own weight in water. Shea butter, a moisturizing ingredient and also has anti-inflammatory properties. Vitamin E an antioxidant and an oil-soluble vitamin that has moisturizing properties. Once that is done, next comes the water phase. This is where water along with emulsifiers, stabilizers, and other components like pigments and fragrances are mixed. When these are done, the oil and water solution is combined to form an emulsion. This is usually accompanied by heating and mixing until the product is completely mixed and the desired viscosity is achieved. Once that is done, the lotion is bottled, labeled, and packed. And that's the final product that you buy from store shelves. Because of the variety of ingredients, some lotions may have an expiry date, and you'll probably see this at the back label. People with allergies should approach lotion usage with caution, especially people who have known allergic reactions to components such as goat's milk, cow's milk, coconut milk, or oil. So it's always best to do a quick skin test before going all out in applying lotion. The Human Voice it is literally what the talk of the town is. Today, we will be talking about the thing that allows us to talk about things. The human voice is the sound that human beings generate by vibrating vocal cords along with our lungs, throats, and mouths. And it's more than just sound. As the human voice is the basic component of speech and language and thus is also responsible for a wide range of human interaction and communication. Now, let's take a look at how the human voice is produced. As we all know, sound is a form of energy that is created from the vibration of objects. So, we can thus look at voice production in three main stages. First, everything starts with an energy or power source. For sound, this comes from the air we exhale as we talk or speak. When we inhale, we take in air into our lungs, and our diaphragms lower while our ribs expand. When we exhale, we do the opposite and release the air through an opening in our throats, called the trachea. This release action sends an airstream that provides the energy to vibrate the vocal cords or the folds in our throats. The next phase is vibration. The exhaled air passes through our larynx or voice box. This contains the vocal cords. When the vocal cords move, they produce a very fast vibration. The frequency of this vibration is responsible for the pitch of our voices or the highness and lowness of the voice that is produced. We can also manipulate our vocal cords to produce higher or lower pitched voice as well. The last stage of vocal production is resonation. The vocal cords themselves produce the sound, but this sound is very simple and quiet. It's actually the other parts of the body like the mouth, throat, and nose that resonate the past air from the vocal cords making it audible. This can be likened to a trumpet, where the buzzing sound produced by blowing travels to the brass chambers and produces the sound that we can hear. All of this happens in a split second. Just imagine how many times these vocal cord vibrations happen as we talk. The sound and quality of a voice is dependent on so many factors, like the amount of air we can breathe in and the size of the resonating chambers like our throats, noses, and mouths. 
this is the reason why people sound different from one another. But the voice and the vocal cords need rest too. Notice how prolonged talking, shouting, and even singing takes its toll on the human voice. That's because your larynx and the vocal cords are overworked and sometimes swollen, but it's nothing a good rest can't fix. But be wary as constant strain on the vocal cords can make this damage lasting and permanent. That's why you'll notice how professionals like singers and voice actors avoid cold drinks, smoking, and overworking their voices, as these factors also affect the well-being of one's voice. Can Opener Every kitchen needs one. It's a device that does one simple thing. Despite that fact, it really is undeniably handy and useful for what it does. Today, we'll be talking about the can opener. As its name suggests, a can opener is a device that is used to easily and safely open cans. Before we look at the can opener, let's take a quick backgrounder. Canning as a food preservation method came about around the 1800s when the Dutch Navy used it to store food rations. Around the same time, the canned salmon industry started to develop out of the Netherlands. By 1810, the process would be patented by Peter Durand. During those times, cans were opened using whatever equipment was available – knives, chisels, hammers, and the like. It would take a few more decades before a dedicated can opener would appear. The first can opener came with around the 1850s. These featured a sharp claw-like lever attached to a handle. Several other designs would emerge, featuring the same lever and claw mechanism. These would be the typical can openers of the time, and be the basis for other designs to come out until the next decade or so. But there was a slight issue of having a sharp edge, which was considered a bit dangerous for domestic use and application. Come the 1870s, a new design would emerge. Patented by William Lyman, this can opener would feature a rotating wheel and a crank wingnut. It works by having a small cutting disc that attaches itself at the rim of the can via a sharp piercing point attached to the top of the can. Once attached, a wing crank connected to the cutting disc would be turned by hand as the disc cuts along the can's rim. In 1925, the Star Can Opener Company improved on Lyman's design, which added a secondary serrated wheel near the cutting disc. This allowed better can grip as the crank was turned. And finally, in 1931, the Bunker Clancy Company created the can opener called the Bunker, featuring a pliers-like handle used to squeeze the cutting disc into the can. Gears connecting the cutting disc and the serrated wheel were turned using the crank, and you'll notice that this is pretty much the precursor to the can openers we have today. This design also became the basis for the electronic can opener, featuring the same cutting wheel and serrated wheel, albeit powered by an electric motor. In the 1980s, the sideways can opener emerged. This featured the cutting disc oriented to the side of the can, allowing it to cut along the actual can lid. The advantage of this design is that the can's lid has a much safer non-jagged edge when cut. Today, more designs are still coming out based on the can openers of yesterday, but with a modern twist, like added functions, portability, and better handles. But the core function remains the same. Semiconductors In today's modern world, there is that one thing that makes the use of all electronics possible. They are these things called semiconductors. Today, let's take a look at the tiny marvels of our modern world. But first, what is a semiconductor? We all know what conductors are. Materials that allow electricity to pass through, and their opposite, the insulator, are materials that inhibit the flow of electricity. Well, as the name suggests, semiconductors are somewhat in between. These are the materials that lets electricity pass, but at the same time, they can influence how electricity flows and how much of it moves. This property allows semiconductors to basically regulate the flow of electrical energy and thus forms the basis for the design and construction of all electrical equipment. But how do they work? Well, how much electricity moves through a semiconductor is influenced by its impurities, or what is called dopants. 
Doping is the process of deliberately adding small amount of impurities from other elements into a crystalline. An N-type semiconductor or negative type mainly allows the passage of the negatively charged electrons, while the P-type semiconductor or positive type carries current that is electron deficient, meaning it is positively charged. This is also what is referred to as a hole. And because of the nature of positively charged and negatively charged objects, we know that these move in opposite direction to each other. When voltage is applied to a semiconductor, electrical current flows. The negative side of the voltages pushes electrons, while the positive side pulls them. This results to an organized flow of electrical current in a stable and measurable state. Semiconductors are usually made up of elements like antimony, arsenic, boron, carbon, germanium, selenium, silicon, sulfur, and tellurium. Although silicon is the most commonly used element. In fact, if you look at any electronic device under its housing, you'll probably see silicon in its circuits. Did you know that before the discovery of elemental semiconductors, engineers and designers used vacuum glass tubes to direct the flow of electricity? You'll find these in older radios and amplifiers. The design worked, but they were prone to overheating and burning out. Plus, the glass tubes were huge compared to the tiny semiconductors of today. Because of this, you could say that semiconductors also paved the way not just for modern electronics but also their small and portable size. A great example of this is the radio. Just look at how drastically it has changed over the last few decades since its invention. Eliminating the glass tube circuits made the radio smaller in size. So the next time you use any modern gadget, you can thank semiconductors for that. Professional Wrestling You probably watch a few matches. It's what people call the most electrifying type of sports entertainment. One part theater, one part fight sports, and one part stunt performance. It's professional wrestling. Professional wrestling is a type of athletic and theatrical performance that closely mimics or portrays combat sports, intertwined with in-ring and backstage storytelling. Characterized by colorful characters called wrestlers who have bigger-than-life personalities with amazing and devastating moves designed to both awe and show hard hits and big impacts. Fans can follow and cheer for the baby face or the protagonist character or boo and rally against the heel or the antagonist persona. While it is largely staged and worked, pro wrestling still follows the combat sports format with its rules and presentation. Typically, a wrestling match has participants battling it out using wrestling moves to weaken each other. A winner is crowned when the opponent is pinned for a 1-2-3 count flat on the ring with shoulders down, or if the opponent submits via tap out on a submission move or lock. Pro wrestling traces its origins to traveling circuses and carnivals. The circus or carnival strongman would issue open challenges to carnival goers, promising a reward if they can best the strongman in hand-to-hand -hand combat. This was accompanied by a joining fee, and often circus crew and the strongmen would do everything in their power to win, sometimes even resulting to cheating. So, organizers decided to create a simulated combat sport and charged people to watch the event instead. Thus, professional wrestling was born. Carnivals and traveling shows featured professional wrestling shows as part of the side act. But in 1901, local promoters got together and formed the NWA or the National Wrestling Association in America. It even created a unified championship belt just like with any other combat sport such as with boxing. The NWA flourished but this all changed during the 1960s when an enterprising Vincent McMahon Jr. started competing with all the territories of the NWA and subsequently landed a TV broadcast deal. This changed the landscape of pro wrestling and is also the reason for its broad appeal as people could now watch it on TV. This is also the reason why wrestling started to feature storylines to accompany the wrestlers in their fights, as the stories are what kept a sense of continuity for the wrestling TV program. Today, the performance art slash combat sport is a worldwide phenomenon 
and despite it being worked and staged, fans who love the sport continue to watch, if not just for the stories, intertwined with the hard-hitting action. Give it a watch and maybe you'll like it too. Robots. It's the stuff of countless science fiction. Automatons, ready to perform any task unfit for his human counterparts. Fighting aliens, rummaging through ruins and transforming into other cool objects. This may be the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about robots. But did you know that robots have been built and used for a range of applications for some time now? Well, a robot is a mechanical or virtual artificial agent. Basically, an electronic machine that is programmed to do specific tasks. Robots can be autonomous, meaning that they move and function on their own. Or semi-autonomous, meaning that they still need human input to do certain things. The word robot actually comes from a Czech play entitled R.U.R., produced in 1920, where the term was used to denote automatons that did forced labor. But the idea for automatically performing task machines existed way before that. Throughout the ancient world are a number of different inventions that may be considered as able to perform tasks automatically. Some examples are the mechanical singing birds, an automatic moving sculpture featuring birds in a fountain designed in ancient Greece, the ancient Greek water clock, and a primitive steam engine designed to spin a globe-like structure also from ancient Greece. Today, however, robots are already being used for applications that may be hazardous or deemed too difficult for human interaction. Most of the tech sent to space to gather data can be considered as robots, like the Mars rover. Robots have also been used for military applications, mostly in the field of bomb diffusion. A type of robot vacuum cleaner that automatically cleans and navigates rooms and furniture is available commercially now. Cars are in fact built and assembled with the help of robots in the factory floor. Engineering clubs and leagues often host robot fighting leagues, where robots are designed for battle, and so on. But wait, where's the androids or human-looking robots, you say? Well, as far as science fiction and reality goes, we're still a long way there. But there have been great developments in the last few years. You can check out the ASIMO, or the Advanced Step in Innovative Mobility, released by Honda in 2000. It was one of the first humanoid robots designed to be a fully functioning mobile assistant. Another notable android is the Ever One Android, developed in 2003 by scientists and engineers from the Korea Institute of Industrial Technology. It's an android with a human-like appearance. It is able to recognize 400 Korean and English words and at the same time react accordingly with facial expressions. Now, as technology becomes more developed and affordable, expect to see more robots designed for practical daily use pretty soon. You've just seen another fun and informative episode from Curious. As always, if you have the questions, then we're here with the answers. Stay inquisitive and stay informed. Catch us again next time on Curious.